was, in a manner of speaking, a man of two worlds. In one, he was a master practitioner, adept at the techniques and methods of his subject. In the other, he was a theoretician, an heir to a long tradition of thought on what was harmonious and proper. This theoretical tradition went back more than two millennia, rooted in the musings of Pythagoras and his followers, and it served its field well. However, in recent times, it had become more of an impediment, a hindrance that retarded progress, and worse, was in danger of falling behind what was happening in practice. How could that happen? How could the theory not keep up with what was really being done? Such was the question being asked in Tuscany by this man who wrote in his most famous dialogue, quote, It appears to me that they who in proof of anything rely on simple authority, without adducting any argument in support of it, act very absurdly. I, on the contrary, wish to be allowed to raise questions freely and answer without any adulation of authorities, as becomes those who are truly in search of the truth." End quote. These words were a warning shot for the ideas that would follow, ideas based not in the ancient theories of music, but in the actual practice of playing a lute. So it was that Vincenzo Galilei engaged Giuseppe Zarlino and any number of other sterile musical theorists in his dialogue on ancient and modern music. In this work, based on the systematic observations of string tension and musical pitch, he was among the first to represent a physical phenomenon using a mathematical relationship. The work would propel Vincenzo beyond the strict and limiting forms of musical melody and harmony to begin a revolution in music that would lead to the Baroque period. Assisting Vincenzo in this work was his eldest son, a mathematician and engineer of some repute, who was also on the path of creating a revolution by the focus on the practical and emphasis on measurement adhered to by his father. Both men would be attacked by the supporters of the traditional views for their work, but one would have an influence far beyond their limited field of study. This week, we begin his story. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 17, Refuting Aristotle. Of all of the figures of Western science, it's hard to find one as discussed, debated, and argued over as Galileo Galilei. While other scientists' ideas may have caused more furor in the public square, Darwin and the origin of species comes to mind, I don't think that I've ever encountered a greater diversity of historical opinion about someone in the sciences as I have regarding this man from Northern Italy. Read one scholar, and Galileo is a brilliant natural philosopher who is alternatively called the father of physics, the father of science, or the man who ended Aristotle. Read another, and the story you get is of a mediocre thinker who is very good at self-promotion. One claims he was a closet atheist, while another portrays him as a devout and committed Catholic trying to save the church from a tragic error. In some accounts, you find a saint and martyr to the cause of scientific independence and objectivity, 
while in others, you have a deeply flawed man caught up in the religious and political currents of his time. So why is this the case? Why is there so much interest and controversy around this one person? Well, I think if you were to go out into a crowd of people and conduct a survey of which scientists of this period, this renaissance that we've been talking about, that they may have heard of, I would expect that most would actually recognize Galileo's name. Fewer, though, would know of his contemporaries, Johannes Kepler and Francis Bacon. Still fewer would have heard of René Descartes and even fewer of Pierre Gassendi. Yet all of these men made contributions to science that could be thought of to match, if not exceed, those of Galileo. Why is it that Galileo becomes the seminal figure of the late Renaissance? If I may be permitted to offer a thesis so early in the episode, I think it has a lot to do with two things. The first is that he becomes such a strong advocate, in time, of overturning the dominant Aristotelian worldview in a time when a lot of people have had just about enough of overturning things and what comes of that. Over and over again, he will contradict little pieces and parts of the Aristotelian system in ways that are difficult to refute, especially from a purely philosophical point of view. Now this is not to say that Galileo wasn't wrong, as he certainly was on a number of occasions, but rather that since the ideas of Aristotle, which had been seen as some sort of coherent whole, had been so tightly woven together with Christian theology in the 13th and 14th centuries, pulling on one string threatened to unravel the whole tapestry in the eyes of some. The second reason is that unlike many of those who came before him, Galileo is working from within the structure that has so strongly associated itself with that worldview, that structure being the scholastic universities. Moreover, unlike the astronomers we've been talking about in our previous episodes, he's working within the field of natural philosophy rather than from within the field of astronomy. The practitioners in that latter discipline have been given the freedom to create models that were unshackled by what was thought to be really happening. Now this is not to say that Copernicus, Tycho, and Kepler didn't believe that the models they put forward weren't descriptions of reality, quite the opposite actually, but rather that the scholastic worldview didn't require those models to be real. They didn't see them as having to contradict what Aristotle had said. For the philosophers of the great universities, these various models of the solar system could be thought of as mathematical instruments to be used to predict the positions of the planets and the timing of various events such as eclipses and conjunctions. They didn't necessarily represent threats to the fundamental paradigm of that time when considered as sort of hypothetical entities. This is different than what Galileo's re-examination of physics would come to do. For this reason, I think that Galileo and his trial, something that we'll look into in detail in a later episode, become a flashpoint in this hinge of Western history. He marks the beginning of the end of a worldview that had dominated Western thought for the previous 500 years, a paradigm, it turns out, that didn't go down without a fight. To understand that, let's look at the scientific work that would lead to the confrontation that was likely as rooted in an attempt to preserve that worldview as it was about religious orthodoxy. If Galileo was a maverick, it could be said that he came by it honestly. Born in 1564, Galileo was the son of a lutenist by the name of Vincenzio, who was given over to not only understanding how to play his instrument well, but also to understanding how music worked. As a music theorist, Vincenzio Galilei was interested in classical Greek forms of music in contrast to the ornate vocal arrangements of his time. In particular, he was interested in finding a solution to the various problems of instrumental music as they related to expressing a single voice or melody. In his work, which married practice and theory, he clashed repeatedly with another theorist by the name of Guiseffo Zarlino. 
During this time, music theory, especially the version espoused by Zarlino, was highly abstract and mathematical in ways that could be seen as restricting innovation. Vincenzo, combining what he knew as an instrumentalist with what he knew in terms of his musical theory that could be shown to actually apply to playing an instrument, was able to move beyond the restrictions in a number of ways. This willingness of the father to stand against unworkable theory through the use of actual experience had to have had an impression on the son. In fact, Galileo would later write that it was his father's work in this area that had the greatest impact on his own developing methods on the study of falling bodies. Now, Galileo was the oldest boy in a family of seven children, something that would later create financial strains due to his need to provide for his sisters in various ways. Born in Pisa, he would remain there for 10 years until the family moved to Florence. While there in Florence, he entered a Camel Delice monastery to continue his studies and was so attracted by the quiet, solitary, and studious life that he entered the order as a novice. However, as the eldest son, the one who would be responsible for providing for the family once his father passed on, this was not really an option, a path that was open to him, and so Vincenzo withdrew his son from the monastery. The father's hope was that Galileo would study medicine and thus have the financial resources to support the family over time. The son, though, was allowed to continue to study with the monks even if he couldn't join the order, something he would do until he left Florence for the University of Pisa in 1581. It was at Pisa that we first see Galileo's willingness to contradict other authorities in a field manifest itself, something he would actually gain a reputation for while being a student. It is also here that he would begin to question the validity of Aristotle's description of falling bodies, specifically the idea that bodies fall with speeds proportional to their size. According to his later writings, Galileo traced his doubt to two things. The first thing was an observation he made of the swinging of a chandelier while attending church services, probably in that first year of 1581. Using his own pulse as a rough timer, he measured the amount of time it took for the chandelier, something in the building there, to swing back and forth and found that it didn't seem to much matter how big the swing was. From this, he arrived at the counterintuitive conclusion that the period of one oscillation of a pendulum didn't depend on the amplitude of the swing. The second thing was his observations of hailstorms, where he noticed that hailstones of different sizes struck the ground at the same time. Galileo reasoned that if the hailstorm formed at roughly the same place in the sky, at the same height, and then fell to the earth, the largest stones should land first, with the size of the stones then decreasing throughout the duration of the storm until the last stones to land were fairly small. At least that would be the case if the Aristotelian explanation of falling objects was correct. What he saw instead was that the size of the hailstones were mixed and more or less remained so throughout the storm thus calling into question Aristotle's description. This second observation is an excellent illustration of what was taking place in scholastic philosophy at this time. The behavior of the natural world was being reasoned out, but not necessarily in a way that was either informed or tested by actual observations of natural events. The hailstone observation is a fairly obvious contradiction to Aristotle's idea but it was not considered because it didn't fit the integrated paradigm. Sure, it could be argued that there would might have been, you know, other factors that might mix up the hailstones, but would it would have been a lot simpler to explain the observations by rejecting Aristotle's explanation. The fact that that never happens tells us a lot, I think, about the overriding importance of the Aristotelian framework. It was one thing for Aristotle to not notice the contradiction to his description of physics, but something else entirely for all of scholastic natural philosophy to have divorced their consideration from, of physics from what was actually happening. We'll discuss this in much greater detail later in this episode. In 1583, Galileo sat in on the lectures of Euclid's elements given by Ostilio Ricci, 
the court mathematician for the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Ritchie was a practical mathematician who immediately recognized Galileo's curiosity and intellect. As a result, he tried to get Vincenzo to allow his son to switch to the study of mathematics, something the older man objected to. Nevertheless, Galileo, after this point, more or less neglects his studies in medicine to focus in math and philosophy until he left the university without graduating in 1585. By this point, Galileo is writing and collecting lectures in physics and cosmography, probably in hopes of using them to secure an academic position. These lectures are completely boilerplate stuff, totally in line with the Aristotelian paradigm being taught all over Europe, leading one to believe that while he may have had doubts, Galileo was smart enough to keep them to himself while looking for a job. Most interesting is that in these notes, he does bring up the topic of Copernican astronomy before rejecting it definitively. In this, the myth that Galileo was some sort of revolutionary Copernican from very early on in his life can be set aside. After leaving the University of Pisa, Galileo supported himself as something of a private tutor, offering instruction in mathematics in both Florence and Siena. In 1586, he wrote his first scientific work on something known as a hydrostatic balance. In it, he began from the work of Archimedes and expanded it using what would become a trademark mixing of theory and practical insight to inform the piece. It's also at about this time that he started to write on motion. In this work, something he'll pick up and put down over the course of the next five or six years, he forms the basis of his investigations on falling bodies and uniformly accelerated motion. In composing it, he was forced to really sit down and examine the ideas of motion, first from Aristotle and then from those who had followed Aristotle, including Archimedes and the Oxford calculators we discussed on our episode on astronomy between the plagues. In 1587, Galileo developed a mathematical technique that allowed one to determine the centers of gravity of certain solid shapes. Again, this was an extension of work that had been done almost two millennia earlier by Archimedes, and it earned him some serious recognition among the scientific community in that area around Pisa. This led to him being invited to present his thoughts on the arrangement of hell as described by Dante in the Inferno. While the works of Dante are now seen as poetry, it should be understood that Dante actually worked very hard to incorporate the appropriate scientific views of various things, including cosmography, into his work. As such, Dante's description of hell was still being debated throughout the 16th century. As a part of this ongoing conversation, the Florentine Academy asked Galileo to weigh in on the topic something he did well enough to impress the head of the academy who would go on to aid Galileo in obtaining a number of professorships over the next couple of years. On the strength of this work, Galileo applied for the professorship at the prestigious University of Bologna, but because he was still a young guy, he was turned down. He was, however, granted the position of professor of mathematics at the University of Pisa in 1589. This was a poorly paid position of little prestige, but it did allow him the space to work and think, and it established his credentials in the academic world of Tuscany as someone who could one day aspire to a more prestigious position if he continued to produce scholarship that was as good as what he had done up to that date. While there, he would produce his first work on motion, a manuscript titled De Motu, in 1590. It is here that one of the most interesting stories about Galileo can be told. In De Motu, Galileo makes the argument that bodies of the same material will fall at equal rates, regardless of their size, a claim that directly contradicted Aristotle. The legend here goes that Galileo demonstrated this by climbing to the top of the already leaning Basilica Tower in Pisa and dropping two iron spheres of differing sizes in the presence of his students and a few of the university's other faculty. Now, to be accurate here, many historians doubt this ever occurred, as the person who tells the story hadn't actually been born when it is said to have happened. However, it does seem that a similar experiment was done later by a detractor of Galileo's who observed that the much larger of the two spheres hit the ground slightly before the smaller one did. So let's take a moment to break this down. 
let's say you were to drop two spheres made of iron from a 50 meter tall tower. Let's also say that one of the spheres is 10 times bigger than the other. According to Aristotle, the bigger sphere would move at a constant velocity that was 10 times greater than the smaller sphere, and so would arrive at the bottom of the tower in one-tenth the time. According to Galileo, on the other hand, the two should arrive at the same time. When this experiment is performed, the larger sphere does hit first, by, but by only a tiny fraction of a second out of the roughly three or so seconds it takes for the two to fall from the top of the tower. So which of the two hypotheses are you likely to think is correct? The one who said that if the smaller ball takes three seconds to fall, the heavier one should only take three-tenths of a second, or the one that says they should land at about the same time? Well, I think the answer to that is pretty obvious. It should also be noted here that there are actually two variables that are being changed in this experiment. The first is the size of the ball, while the second is the weight. In the thinking of the time, the two were conflated, but that did not have to be the case, something Galileo seems to have realized later on. One could have modified the experiment to drop wooden and iron spheres of the same size, thus allowing for just the weight dependence of the fall time to be tested. There is no evidence, however, that this was ever done. The reason likely had to do with the Aristotelian idea that wood contained more of the element water than iron did and thus would behave differently in its fall time. De Motu begins a long and slowly escalating feud with some of the natural philosophers in the Tuscany region of northern Italy. As we mentioned earlier, the Aristotelian system is an integrated whole. With the writing of De Motu, Galileo has begun pulling at the loose ends in the tapestry, and it, it starts to look a little bit, just a tiny bit, like it might all start to unravel. The reason these natural philosophers push back is not only that the cherished system is beginning to look a bit frayed, but also that Galileo isn't replacing it with some other fully integrated system. As a way of contrasting this with another idea, these guys, Ptolemaic to a man, might have rejected Copernicus for a variety of reasons, but at least Copernicus gave them a complete model to work with. Galileo is just working on small, individual problems, such as the local motion of falling bodies, and so he didn't really try to create a bigger, integrated picture, something he claimed was beyond his, or anyone's for that matter, ability. This shift in focus from global to local investigation is going to be a big part of the pushback from the philosophical community against Galileo's work. One other note is in order here. De Motu is a work in progress. Galileo is engaged in active research on motion, and a number of the conclusions he reaches in the manuscript were incorrect, something he readily acknowledged. The material was circulated through lecture notes, the copying of that manuscript, and presentations to college colleagues during this time, rather than being printed up for wider consumption. In this, De Motu, in some ways, is pretty similar to a modern conference preprint paper that is circulated through a scholarly community for comment and feedback. The biggest problem with the work in De Motu was that Galileo was still working from the Aristotelian assumption that the only motion is that of what we call uniform velocity, i.e. an object moving with constant speed in the same direction. For him to be able to make any real progress, he would need to consider the idea of motion where the velocity can change. Now, while continuing to work on motion, Galileo's father died in 1591, saddling him with significant financial burdens as the oldest son of the family. Additionally, he feared that his three-year appointment at the University of Pisa might not be renewed, and so he sought out new employment. With the help of friends and associates who were now convinced of his talent and ability, he was able to secure a position as professor of mathematics at Italy's second most prestigious mathematical institution, the University of Padua, at three times, I might say, his previous salary. Thus, starting in 1592, he immediately begins offering courses in military science to a large number of young foreign nobles who attended the university's law school destined to return home to take over the affairs of state 
when the time came. These courses included topics such as architecture, fortification, surveying, and of course mechanics. Notably, it isn't until 1595 that Galileo shows even the slightest interest in research in the field that will be the thing that he becomes best known for, astronomy. However, during this year, he hits on an idea for explaining the tides, one that requires him to assume that the Copernican model is not just a calculational instrument, but rather a description of the actual motions of the Earth. This begins what will be a somewhat long road towards a full commitment to heliocentrism. In 1597, Galileo responded in a letter to an incorrect argument against Copernicus's model in a book written by his colleague, a man named Mazzoni. His response shows that he was begun to think that Copernicus's model is better suited to answer certain questions Ptolemy is unable to address. His next step seems to be revealed in a letter written to Johannes Kepler shortly after this. Galileo had received a copy of Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum from a German traveler who Kepler had given a couple of copies of his book to to distribute to whomever he thought might be interested as he traveled to Italy. After traveling around most of Italy, the traveler realized that he had neglected his duty and so on his way out of the country he pressed the copies into Galileo's hands as a second thought. As we've discussed, the book is unapologetically Copernican in its outlook, coming before Kepler's work with Tycho and his data. Galileo wrote a letter to Kepler in response to the book, saying that he had accepted the Copernican model due to its ability to solve new problems Ptolemy's model couldn't, probably a reference to his work on tides. However, he had mostly held back in expressing his support due to the opposition he felt from within the Scholastic Academy. Kepler would write back, full of youthful exuberance, encouraging Galileo to openly express his support for Copernicanism and asking him to make a variety of astronomical observations. He would not hear back from the Italian natural philosopher on that topic or any other topic for another 13 years. Here, we see a very notable difference between the two men who might have been colleagues under different circumstances. Galileo was deeply enmeshed in the academic world, where the old views held sway. The scholarly line from which Kepler will come is something apart from that. If we think about it, Ke Copernicus never had an academic position. Rheticus started at a university, but that university was philippist in curriculum and outlook. Even with that, he was forced out of the academy by both his unwillingness to conform to its standard and his own personal preferences and missteps. Tycho's class standing prohibited him from joining a university faculty, and so he was free to pursue his own ideals, while Kepler, as we have seen, will never hold an academic position and had the rather good fortune when he was in academy of studying under one of the few individuals, Michael Maislin, who was willing to explore ideas outside of the scholastic norm. The intellectual lineage of Kepler allowed him to pursue and investigate ideas with relatively little professional censure as long as he was willing to cast a few horoscopes for the civil authorities. For Galileo, the opposite would be true. Ensconced in the Aristotelian paradigm, each time he attempted to suggest alternative explanations, he would be criticized and fought by opponents. Now, to be clear, this was part of the scholastic method of seeking knowledge, the probing, the questioning, the criticism of ideas, and no doubt Galileo was to expect such a response to anything new he might do in the areas of creating new knowledge. But, as will become very clear, these challenges will go far beyond just the critical evaluation of new ideas to outright hostility and personal attack. So, instead of engaging Kepler in 1597, Galileo was more involved in his work with military science, something that he was doing as much to pay the bills as his professional appointment in Pata would allow him to do. In addition to writing a treatise on the subject, he invented a new type of military compass that was intended to solve certain problems related to the use of artillery. However, as he worked with the theory behind the instrument, he recognized that it could be used to solve almost any type of mathematical problem that might be encountered in the field. 
By 1599, he had contracted with a craftsman to make the instruments for sale. About a hundred of them eventually ended up getting made. Of course, with this came a course in how to use this new technology and a book to go with it. In 1600, he began a relationship with a Venetian woman by the name of Marina Gamba. Marina, who he never married, would bear him three children, daughters in 1600 and 1602, and a son in 1606. It would also be around this time that he would invent an early temperature measuring device known as a thermoscope, something that would be refined and advanced by his friend and student, Giovanni Francesco Sagredo, for use in medicine. In 1602, Galileo would resume his work on mechanics and motion, and so begin revising the De Motu manuscript. He started from his incorrect assumptions in the earlier manuscript and investigated them once again by considering the motion of Pendula. He first confirmed his earlier observations that the period of the oscillation was independent of the amplitude of the swing, something that would later be shown to only be approximately true by the physicist Christian Huygens, whose connection to the subject, by the way, and to Galileo, was through a student of Galileo's father. Galileo also showed that the period of the pendulum was independent of the weight of the mass at the end of the string, reinforcing the idea that the motion of falling bodies were also independent of this property. He then established a relationship between the period and the length of the pendulum, showing that the period varied as the square root of the length of the string. As important as these things were, however, the more useful insight he seems to have gained from this work was that the motion of the pendulum bob, the thing at the end of the string, was not constant, and that there was a sense that there was this continuation of the motion once it was acquired as the bob reached the lowest point in the swing. What he realized is that Aristotle and those who came after him were wrong in assuming that things moved with a constant velocity. In this, he came to the understanding that he had to recast the entire problem in terms of continuously changing motion. Now, as we discussed in an earlier episode, this wasn't a completely new idea. Men like Buridan, Oresme, and the Oxford calculators had considered changing motion, but their models weren't actually something where the velocity changed continuously. They were more like objects that would travel a short time at a constant velocity and then receive a kick that would bump their velocity up to a new, higher, but still constant velocity. One way to think of this is to imagine a basketball rolling along the ground in a straight line at constant velocity. If you were to strike the ball with a stick in the direction of its motion, the velocity would jump from the original speed to something a bit higher. If you did this many times in succession, you would have a series of stepped up constant velocities resulting in the ball traveling faster and faster. The men at Oxford were able to develop a mathematical technique known as mean velocity theory to explain how this would work. It was an ingenious idea, but it still rested in the Aristotelian idea of objects moving with constant velocity. What Galileo did was work out a demonstration that the velocity changed not discreetly or impulsively, but rather continuously by using balls rolling down inclined ramps. The way he seems to have done this was to have a very slightly inclined ramp that a ball rolled down. As it rolled, he would mark its position at a series of equal times. There are a few accounts of how he kept track of the time as accurate clocks weren't actually available to him at this time. Some suggest that he used a musician to play a melody with a well-known beat, while others think he constructed a water clock of some sort where the drops of water would be allowed to fall onto a metal surface which would make a sharp enough sound to use as something of a measurement tool. It's very possible that he actually used multiple methods in order to verify his results. Whatever the timing mechanism, though, Galileo was able to arrive at the result that the distance of the ball and how far it traveled increased according to an odd-numbered sequence of 1, 3, 5, 7, etc., thus leading to a total distance traveled by the ball as being given by the numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, or the square of the number of beats that he was using as his measuring device, at least for the time anyway. 
This is really a very revolutionary result. But it would take Galileo another three years to work out the full consequences of what the experimental data was telling him. He made a couple of mistakes along the way that he had to sort through. But by 1608, he had a very workable version of what we call the law of falling bodies. Well, I'll talk about this in greater detail at the end of the episode. What's really interesting here are two things. The first is Galileo's reliance on exact measurement to arrive at his conclusions. Prior to this time, this had not been characteristic of natural philosophy. Instead, it seems that Galileo brings this idea over from astronomy, possibly being influenced here by the exacting work of Tycho. The second is his combining of that exactitude of measurement with the use of mathematical models to describe the behavior of nature. In this specific case, he would use a form of proportional reasoning that was taken from Euclid's elements. Just as Kepler was doing over the Alps with the orbits of the planets, Galileo was reducing the behavior of a specific class of systems to a set of precise mathematical relationships without having to know the causes of the behavior of the systems. Had Galileo had a chance to write this up and publish it, there is little doubt that it would have ignited a firestorm of controversy in the scholastic community. Instead, as he was preparing the manuscript, other news came to him that diverted his attention. At this point, we'll pause the scientific narrative as we are on the cusp of Galileo's better known and more serendipitous astronomical work. Before we conclude though, I would like to make a few more comments regarding the nature of his work, specifically the methodology. Beyond a recounting of Galileo's scientific work, it's also necessary to take some time to understand what he and his contemporaries did with respect to creating a fundamental shift in how the characterization of the natural world was done. For Aristotle, natural philosophy was founded on two sorts of knowledge, derived from different sources. One of these types of knowledge he called techne, from which we get our word technology, of course. This sort of knowledge is derived from practical experience, and the goal of having it was to know what to do the next time a situation presented itself. Our episode on metallurgy had several examples of this kind of knowledge. Mixing different amounts of tin oxide and copper in your smelter produced bronzes with different hardnesses and lusters. The knowledge of how to vary the mixture to achieve certain alloys that had whatever properties you might have desired as the craftsman was what Aristotle called techni. The other type of knowledge was a Episteme, the origin of the word of the subdiscipline of philosophy known as epistemology. For Aristotle, this sort of knowledge was founded upon the use of reason informed by observations made by the senses. This is what could be considered scientific knowledge, and for something to be quote unquote known or understood in this sense, the philosopher had to use reason to arrive at four causes related to the thing being considered. Aristotle's physics described these four causes, known as the material, formal, efficient, and final, for all of the different types of change he observed in nature, and so it became the accepted paradigm that for any changes to Aristotle's physics to be accepted, a similar description of all of the causes would have to be offered. Galileo doesn't do that. What Galileo and some of the others do is upend this. Stillman Drake, in his biographical contribution to the Oxford University Press's very short introduction series, titled Galileo Writes, quote, The scientific revolution consisted, to a large degree, in erasing those classical distinctions and in bringing the kind of knowledge acquired from practical experience together with the kind achieved through reason, even at the cost of accepting knowledge of what to do next time in place of understanding the causes of things. This latter move is more politely described as the search for laws instead of causes. End quote. This is a fundamental step in one thread of developing what we think of as scientific inquiry today. 
in a work Galileo would publish in 1623 titled The Assayer. Galileo would break his methodology into three distinct steps. In his first step, when he would call organized observation, he would write, quote, Basing the world of sensible experience, we isolate and examine as fully as possible a certain typical phenomenon in order to first intuit those simple, absolute elements in terms of which the phenomenon can be most easily and completely translated into mathematical form, which amounts, putting the matter another way, to a resolution of the sensed fact into such elements in quantitative combinations." End quote. In other words, to understand the world you experience through your senses, you first focus on those essential pieces of the experience that can be represented mathematically and then do so. Galileo also calls this the intuition of elements, but it is better known today as part of the idea of scientific reductionism. The second step in his method is his practice known as sufficiency. Here he says, quote, If we have performed this step properly, we need the sensible facts no more. The elements thus reached are their real constituents, and deductive demonstration from them by pure mathematics must always be true of similar instances of the phenomenon, even though, at times, it should be impossible to confirm them empirically." End quote. Here, Galileo is saying that once we have mathematical relationships, we no longer have to worry about making observations to arrive at knowledge. Instead, we can work from the mathematical expressions by the use of deductive reasoning to arrive at additional conclusions, some of which might not be observable. Finally, his third step he calls experiment. Here he writes, quote, For the sake of more certain results, however, and especially to convince by sensible illustration those who do not have such implicit confidence in the universal applicability of mathematics, it is well to develop, where possible, demonstrations whose conclusions are susceptible of verification by experiments. Then, with the principles and truths thus acquired, we can proceed to more complex related phenomena and discover what additional mathematical laws are there implicated." End quote. Here we have the idea of using mathematical hypotheses to make testable and verifiable predictions of the behavior of systems. It should be noted that in his way of thinking, these are done to convince the skeptical rather than to test the description of the system. This is an important distinction. What can be seen here is a really solid advancement in what scientific inquiry ought to be. This method, arrived at over a lengthy period of time, informed all of Galileo's subsequent work and is implicit in almost everything after 1600. It represents a fundamental rejection of Aristotelianism and will play a significant role in the conflict that is to come. As you can tell from the timely release of this episode, I managed to squeeze enough time out of the midterm giving and grading to put something together for an episode. I have to say my students are doing great and it looks like we're all going to survive the process pretty well, so I'm really pleased about that. Hopefully, from this point forward, I'll be able to stay on a pretty regular schedule until we get towards the vacation periods and the holiday periods around Thanksgiving or Christmas break. Next week, we'll take a look at Galileo's astronomical observations and that slowly growing conflict with both the intellectual community of Italy and the religious institutions there. Following that is our 100th episode. We've had a couple of great questions submitted, but we really could use some more. Remember, these can be about anything, so don't be afraid to ask. Trust me, I don't think there anything is really that I would call stupid questions, as long as you don't already know the answer. So ask away. Send me your questions at cldavies at mac.com. Post them on our Facebook page. 
ask via Twitter. My handle there is at Chad Davies. Leave a comment at the scientific odyssey.typepad.com or, you know, send them via carrier pigeon, whatever. Just give me your questions, anything you want to ask. Let's make episode 100 a great one. Also, a big shout out to the folks at the Blue Dot Sessions for letting us use their music as a backdrop for the show. You can listen to more of their contributions at their website, sessions.blue. And I hope you go out there and take a listen. It's really fantastic stuff. So anyway, until next time, full sails on your journey.